In performance, the actions are the only thing we can control. In brace nerves, just don't go to plan set. The Michael Jordan's never played better in finals. What he did is made sure he kept the same level and let the adrenaline in the finals make him play better. A loser would say, I dropped the ball because it was raining. The winner would say, I need to practice wet football so the next time it rains I can catch it. It's a basic law of physics. For things to change, things have to change. You say, what would I be doing if I felt good? With Blackie, he had to be talking, moving, chatting, whatever. Whereas if Nigel was quiet, I wouldn't worry about that. When players say to me, I'm having trouble kicking for goal, they're thinking, how can I get my mind right to kick for goal? See, we have this horrible conspiracy that's been taught if your head is not positive, you can't perform. I have four degrees and a doctorate in psychology, 50 years clinical experience, and I can't control my mind and I can't control my emotions. When I give you a thought, if you act on it, I'll make the thought louder. You don't have to feel good to act good, but when you act good, it feels good. So if somebody says, I'm not enjoying my footy now, what do I know? The way you're handling your footy now is not working. And that was this week's guest, Phil Jauncey. Welcome to the one-on-one football podcast. My name is Andrew Raines, founder of one-on-one football. And always joined by our co-host, Harry Simington. Welcome, Simo. Thanks, Rainsy. Good to be here. We've uh, we've just hopped off the conversation with Dr. Phil Jauncey. It's coming up for all the listeners now. But, um, mate, I think it's probably the first episode where the first question that we've asked, the answer's gone for about 50 minutes. He can uh, He can certainly talk, Dr. Phil. It's an old saying: "Can talk underwater with a mouth full of marbles," and he, he did today. But it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. <laughs> when we say that, we say it in, in all due respect because it wasn't. Um, he actually uh, he actually broke down a lot of the the key themes that we were willing to um, ask him um, yeah. and talk to him about. So it was it was actually really perfect in the end, just to sort of sit back and listen. And a lot of it made sense. It's super engaging. Um, mate, do you want to give him uh, give the the listeners before they tuck into today's episode? Um, do you want to give him a bit of a background on, on Phil? Yeah, so um, Phil Jaunty is, is a leading performance psychologist, one of the um, most well-renowned in Australia and overseas as well. Um, he's an author. He's got three books, which we touch on right at the end. Um, he's worked with some of the biggest sporting and corporate organizations, in the uh, not only in Australia, but overseas as well. Um, most of our listeners will probably recognize him from the Brisbane Lions era. He features quite heavily in the Lee Matthews um, uh, autobiography. Um, but he's also worked with Wayne Bennett at the Brisbane Broncos, um, a bunch of different cricket teams, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. He's got one of the basically the the, um, the most dense CVs you'll uh, you'll ever come across. He's been to the Olympics. Um, he's been involved in Davis Cup teams, rugby league, English rugby. He's he's done it all. Um, but he he likes to refer to himself as a performance psychologist, not a sports psychologist. And he's got a really, I think, polarizing view on psychology. He doesn't talk about getting the mind right or waiting until your mind's right before you act right. He talks about acting right, and then that'll help your um your mindset you feel good once you've acted good not the other way around so i think um yeah really polarizing but um, really really insightful um discussion that we've just had yeah it's incredible and i, I, I think i'm it's finally of like a hooray someone to, so i mean i i, I did uh, work a bit with phil um at the lines when i was sort of there like got him back after their successful era there and, and vossi got him back to do some of their person personality profiles and, and player profiles um but what I was sort of alluding to is, is it sort of it spoke my language in terms of the big one for me is is in the first sort of topic that we talk about the power of positive doing, and I'm a big one for that. I've been around a lot yeah. of football clubs and organisations where there's a lot of words on the on the walls, and and there are a lot of I forget the exact exact term. I might be able to help me out here, but they're sort of like um, they're they're emotive sort of words, sort of like um Trade, uh, like trademarks. descriptions, yeah, trademarks, beliefs, um, things like ruthless or respected and things like that and he goes you can't measure that and i've always been a big believer yeah. going having action so um he used examples of you know i think he worked with the queensland bulls before they became successful and they and one of their the the turnarounds was or their uh, the start of their success was was having these little actions and one of them was on time and and that that's just a perfect one instead of saying you know punctual yeah. or you know sort of having so the thing of it's are you on time or not on time that's one of our you know sort of our trademarks and and an action i really love that and i hope um a lot of our coaches and players can learn a fair bit out of that yeah and he, and he spoke about plan a and plan z and, and plan a being the actions that you do when you're at your best and plan z being the actions you do when you're not at your best or when you're at your worst um for example goal kicking we have such a terrible you know league-wide such a terrible percentage 
with goal kicking, but then field kicking is so high. Like the, we actually change our technique and he spoke about that and, and how the, the psychology of goal kicking can be affected by the actions that you take. So instead of thinking that the reason why I miss set shot goals is because my mind's under pressure. It's the other way around. It's because you change your actions and that makes your mind um, feel the stress. So uh, I think like there's a really good, um, he has a really good contrast between philosophical ideas and concepts and, and he understands, he explains the concepts, but like we were talking about off air, Ranzi, he, he then gives examples and real um, r- real practical examples of, of how that looks um, on the field or in training. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those, he's one of those people that that leaves you wanting more like you, you you're interested it's um it's it's engaging and i feel like a lot of people will be able to relate to his messaging not only with their football but in their life as well he's speaking about relationships and um and how again like you said Ranzi, the power of positive action or positive doing as opposed to the power of positive thinking um it's a really, really interesting concept. Yeah, and, and we're mindful to jump back and forth because we knew if we asked him a question, he probably would go for another 15, 20 minutes. It was not bad, but you can't probably have a yeah. podcast for a whole day. So um, there's another one I want to discuss here. Back back to that goal-kicking one. It just, yeah, it was like music to me mm-hmm. is again um, with the how he said we change everything. And I've just been watching football. Those are two examples. been watching football, um, if, obviously, if I always watch football, but um, around goal kicking and, and a lot of the players snapping now and not thinking about it. And you watch players that are, oh, they got the yips. Oh, is he going to go back here and snap it? And they, they just play on and kick it. And they're more successful when they're yeah. going back, putting their socks up, throwing the grass up. I mean, no one's probably done that since Matty Lloyd, but, um, you know, sort of getting that routine. We're <laughs> big on routine, which is fine, and I do coach that. But maybe I'm sort of changing my tune a bit now with the way I, I might coach it because he's right. And the more I'm breaking down this, um, you know, the snaps for goal is they're more successful, they're more comfortable snapping for goal because they're not feeling as under pressure, not thinking about it. They're just going back and nailing it. And yeah. that's how... We probably should be kicking. And there's another example. My brother, my older brother, was up and um, a couple of weeks ago from Adelaide, and we just went down. I haven't had a friendly kick in the park um, for a long time, and we just went down the local footy oval at Sulk Oval there at Palmy, um, and we're having a few shots and a bit of muck around for a game. And I coach a lot of it, so I was all, all, all having covered here, and I was going back through the routine and trying to do it. And I haven't actually done it for a while, and he was beating me. We were getting, um, <laughs> it, was, it was bringing back a few memories, getting quite competitive, and he was kicking well, and he said. When we're warming up before we we're field kicking, he goes, mate, you, were, I wasn't moving. You just hit, hit, hit me, lace out. And I said, you're right. He goes, why don't you just go back and kick yeah. like that? And we sort of just changed it. And he had that approach. He was just hitting him probably a bit more sort of field kicking yeah. height. And he was nailing him. And I was like, wow, that's that's so true. So um, he was actually coaching me, which which he used to obviously a lot when I was younger. But that was, um, yeah, something to think <laughs> about. So I'm changing my tune with that goal kicking stuff. I think that's it's really good for me as a coach. I learned a lot out of it from those sort of two examples and linking back to feel um just quite amazing um yeah blown away um and before we get into it it, just the the personality profile system was was incredible too mate yeah very much so and and we obviously have um different profiles on the structure side of things i like structure and to be prepared and then we we went through your profile as well and just for the listeners bit of context before the podcast we um did the personality profile test for phil and he came with the um with the chart of our different profiles so um, on the podcast, that's the first time we heard them from him. Um, but yeah, he sort of talks about the profiles and how everyone's got a different um, personality and then how that can affect your plan A. So my plan A is going to be different to Rainsy's because I like structure and I like to be prepared and I need more time because I'm on that thinker side of the spectrum. So I, I need time to prepare and, and go through the process. But it means that I lack um, adaptability on the spot, whereas Rainsy, that's one of your strengths um, as a mozzie um, personality type so we sort of talk about the different personalities and i think you'll you'll understand very quickly that um phil himself is a, is a mozzie um but for example his plan a was talk fast tell bad jokes and for his personality that's what means that he's um on his plan a if he's not talking fast and telling bad jokes he's in his plan z so um yeah some super insightful um uh topics i think coming up in this episode Ranzi and um might as well get straight into it. Without further ado, this is episode number 26 with Phil Jaunty. You're listening to the one-on-one football podcast, the number one podcast for Aussie rules, training, coaching, and development tips. Here's the original Dr. Phil, Australia's Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil Jaunty. Thanks for joining us, mate, and welcome to the show. My pleasure to be here. 
Yeah, most of our listeners will know from your from your work with the Brisbane Lions um, through their premiership years, mate. But you've um, you've also worked with a wide range of other sports too. Um, could you give us a, a brief overview of your career to date and some of the teams um, slash athletes um, that you've worked with? Well, I've had lots of teams over the years. I um, way back I was working with Sub District Rugby League when Wayne Bennett was coaching under 18s, um, and um, since then I've worked with local. Uh, BRL Brisbane Rugby League teams such as Valleys and stuff but my first top team was the uh, Brisbane Bullets in basketball um, back in uh, 86, 87, 88 when we won a championship then and then in those days the coaches in Brisbane used to all get together and uh, so in Brisbane it's not like Rugby League didn't like Union or mm. rules. they all got together so what happened is Brian Curl who was coaching the Bullets used to get Wayne Bennett together, uh, Rawls, uh, Robert Rawls with the Lions, John Conley with the Union, Mike Young with baseball, John Buchanan with cricket, and those coaches all got together, and Brian was talking about how they used me, and so slowly but surely I got brought in to start working with the Broncos, with the Lions, uh, with the Union, with the baseball, and then since then, um, I had 15 years with the Broncos, um, 15 years with the Lions. Um, I was with Australian Cricket, was Queensland Cricket Bulls for 20 years, but with Australian Cricket from uh, 2003 to 2008. One of the things I often tell people is that when I've been with a successful team, the next coach thinks I need a compass because when I was with uh, Australian Cricket twice, we won 15 tests in a row. And when John Buchanan left, I said to, uh, Tim Nilsson, the new coach, you want me to work with you? He says, no, I'm going another direction. I was with the Broncos 15 years, uh, three or four premierships, not five premierships. Uh, Ivan Hinjack, the Broncos' new coach, going another direction. And of course, when Lee Matthews left the Lions, I get, guess what I got told? Go another direction. So mm. uh, I obviously will send people astray and get lost. But no, I've been to three Olympics. Um, I was a coordinating psychologist at the... Um, uh, the Athens Olympics, but I've been. A, I was at Barcelona and Sydney. I've been. I've carried trophies around the MCG, SCG with uh, league and rules. Been to world championships in baseball and that sort of stuff. So I've been around. You have, mate. And and before that, so where'd you sort of work your craft and and sort of um, was well, big on on developing your skills and, and expertise. So take us back a bit further. Sort of where did you develop? Sort of was it any particular sport? Obviously university days. Um, talk us through a bit the early days for you. Okay. Well, I was always a very average player. Um, I was mentioning Brian Curl when I was playing A grade. He was playing C grade. He went to the Munich Olympics and I went to B grade. When I played rugby league, I was so bad I never got sledged. Um, so what happened was, as a as a psychologist. Uh, I was working with teams and I was, I was a lecturer at Malkovac Teachers College and we had a rugby league team so I was working with them and that's what got me involved with rugby league and ultimately suggesting we have state of origin mm-hmm. like the AFL used to, well VFL in those days used to have um, and um, so that I used my counseling skills as a psychologist now in those days sports psychology didn't exist no. and in many ways, now I actually tell people I'm not a sports psychologist, a performance psychologist, because I was actually looking at the University of Queensland sports psychology university course, and only two things in there about performance. All the rest was about getting your mind right, focus, which I think is absolute crap, because uh, in sport, you don't have time to get your mind right. You just try to keep your actions right. So what I did is I developed what I was doing as a counselor, as an educator, into sport. And... Uh, find out, trying to ask myself, not about, see the word motivation in history never meant incentive. It actually comes from the word motion. So the idea to motivate a player nowadays means to give him incentive. It's like a coach saying before the game we have to win and the player said, I didn't know that, I'm glad you told me that. Winning might be important. I mean, that's actually rubbish. In fact, what motivation is really mean is what handbrake was removed to get motion. And so what I looked at as a psychologist, why would players have a bad game because nobody wants to have a bad game and so a lot of players think that there's a god of form got nothing better to do and says okay Phil today you're gonna be great no you're gonna be average 
And you get players say this, I could tell after five minutes whether I was in the zone. And I always say to people, well, what skills did you have when you weren't in the zone? Oh, well, you know, I wasn't with it. Or in cricket, I couldn't see the ball. Were you blind? Um, I mean, there's, there are all these sayings that come into sport that's rubbish. So what I found very early in the piece is when players come to me, I just had a rugby league player here yesterday, and he said, Lil, I'm worried about my confidence. Now, I have a rule. If you can't see it, you can't fix it. I've never seen a confidence. I don't know what color it is. I don't know how much it weighs. And so when people talk about attitude, focus, confidence, they're actually losers. I was actually talking to a lot of high schools. They have the traditional sports psych course, and then they get me to come in. And uh, I actually said to the, the group the other day, I said, listen, if you believe in being positive and having a good mental focus to be successful in sport, you should give up the sport. And they all looked at me. I said, what do you mean? Well, I've just knocked the ball on and the opposition scores a try. You know, I've just given away a penalty and the opposition scores a goal. I've just dropped a catch in the field. Are you going to be positive? And so the rubbish that comes out is that people say, unless you're positive, you can't perform. Whereas in fact, you actually have to look at players who played well when they weren't positive, when they didn't feel good. See, I don't always feel like a loving dad and a loving husband, but I can always act like a loving dad and a loving husband. And so the question is, why would I not act like a loving dad and a loving husband? Why would you not kick correctly? For example, in all the rules, kicking for goal, Lee Matthews has said, been something that hasn't improved in a hundred years. Mm -hmm. And yet it's really simple why people don't kick well for goal. In the illustration I give, we had a um, midfielder for the Lions who kicked two out on the full by about three and a half meters in a game. Now that means he missed, I think it's 6.4 meters between goalposts in Aussie Rolls. You guys are more expert at that than yeah. I am. And so if he missed by three and a half meters, that means he missed by 14 meters. Mm -hmm. Now if I see a player downfield clear, I've just taken a mark, but he's clear, how often will I miss him by more than a meter? Mm -hmm. And most people say about 3%. It'd be really rare. So why is it that I can kick at 97% accuracy to a player, and yet the exact same skills are required to kick, interesting, not two goal, four goal. You never kick four mm -hmm. a player, kick two a player, but you kick four goal. It's interesting in those rules. Mm -hmm. The accuracy in the AFL is about 53%. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got to ask yourself, why is that? Are the skills of the player kicking any different than the skills um, kicking for goal? Mm. No. And I don't know whether you can see me, but I'll show you what I mean here. Hope you can still hear me taking up my microphone. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Now, when you take a mark and you see a player downfield, what you do is you go back, you do not look at the ball, you keep your shoulders over your pelvis and you look at the player. And as soon as you think you're clear to get the ball to him, you keep. You don't look at the ball, you just look at the player. Mm -hmm. Would you ever do this? Wait, wait, wait! <sighs> <sighs> and pick up your socks. And would you ever kick to another player with the hands together? No. So if you know when you do plan, that's what I call Z. Plan Z, you're 53% accurate. When you plan A, you're 97% accurate. What should you do? So anyway, putting my earphones back on, I said to this midfielder, what I want you to do next time you take a mark, don't turn around. Go straight back. Do not look at the ball. The, the one constant the umpire. Kick it one meter of the umpire's head. It took him 15 months before he missed his next set, set shot of goal. And that missed shot because he was a little midfielder. He was 55 meters out. He hit the inside post. So in two years, he went from less than 50% accuracy to 97% accuracy. Mm. From a guy who can't kick. The Lions used to love giving me a ball in Melbourne to kick because uh, I was no rugby league player and in those days we never kicked. And I look like a drunken giraffe on stilts when I <laughs> kick. And that's insulting to the giraffe. So I can never be out of form in all the rules. And yet I've worked with cricketers and I can't bat. I've worked with all, all these others. And yet, I remember one time we had a game, we were down to the Swans by uh, six points full time, and Johnny, Jonathan Brown had a kick, a bleak kick, about 60 meters, really long kick. And he said, fellas, just remember what you said. I didn't try to kick for goal, try to kick it over the umpire's head, and he tied the game. Hmm. Now, to me, 
when players say to me, I'm having trouble kicking for goal, they're thinking, how can I get my mind right to kick for goal? What mm -hmm. I'm saying is, no, you need to keep your computer on, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But the, the key here is, it's the action we can control. You see, I have four degrees and a doctorate in psychology. I have 50 years clinical experience, and I can't control my mind, and I can't control my emotions. So if I'm angry at you, I have no control over being angry. What I have control is saying, up yours. Mm -hmm. Or I can say, good day. Or let's assume that Harry's just got a job that I think I deserve and I think he backstabbed to get it. Do I have any control over feeling jealous? No. What I have control over is what I'm doing making things better or is what I'm doing making things worse. Mm. So I can actually say, you know, you backstabbing bastard to Harry and everybody says, thank heavens we didn't give the job to Phil. Or I can say, listen, I really thought I was going to get the job, really thought it was better for the job, how can I help you? For example, let's assume that I think... Um, the referee needs a rule book in Braille, or the umpire in your sport needs a rule book in Braille. Now, as Barry found out, telling the referee about his parentage doesn't help mm -hmm. because you get 250 media pen penalties. Mm -hmm. Now, those things are all in our control. And so, I teach the power of positive doing. That is, what are you doing when you're being successful? What are you doing when you're not? And everybody has different doings. We'll talk about, again, this later on as well, the profiles. See, my profile is that I, I go really well when I speak quickly, tell really bad jokes. For example, why the guy calls his girlfriend hinges? Why? She has something to adore. <laughs> That's good. That's why'd, the guy get, why'd the guy get rid of his vacuum cleaner? Why? It sucked. <laughs> Dad joke. A bear walks into a... A bear walks into a bar and he says, I'll have a gin and tonic. And the barman <laughs> said, why the big paws? Because I'm a bear. <laughs> anyway. That's great. Now, I, I could have had the worst day in the world. My wife could have picked on me. I always tell people, when my wife and I got married with something in common. She loved me and I loved me. Um, <laughs> now, I can still speak quickly, tell bad jokes, can I? Mm. And so that's why I only talk about those things that you can control. So if I'm your boss or your coach, I never say you have a bad attitude, you're undisciplined, or you're lazy, because they're all judgments. Mm. And the only people who can judge are perfect. And I've looked in the mirror, there's no St. Phil. What I can say is I notice you haven't done two or the three things. Four to six things um, you've done badly, or you've taken five times longer than somebody else. In other words, in performance, the actions are the only thing we can control. As I said before, I can always act like a loving dad. Mm -hmm. I can't always feel like a loving dad. And so I have no excuse about not feeling loving, but I have, so I have lots of excuses not feeling loving, but I have no excuse not acting that way. Yeah. And so my dad was a psychologist, and years ago a man came to him and said, oh, Dr. Jonesy, I've fallen out of love with my wife, want to divorce, want to divorce her. My dad said, look, what I want you to do for the next five days do something special for your wife every day. Like what? Take her out to eat, buy her some flowers. On the sixth day, we'll talk about the divorce. Anyway, came back on the sixth day, said, Dr. Jones, I'm embarrassed. My dad said, why? I fall in love with my wife. And so what happened, he was waiting to feel romantic to acromantically. It's the other way around. When you acromantically, you feel romantic. And to put it a different way, you don't have to feel good to act good, but when you act good, it feels good. For example, I ask athletes, when's it most important that you feel good? before an event or after event. And you'd be surprised how many people say before. So mm -hmm. before, you felt great before, but you sucked. So, oh, maybe afterwards. Mm -hmm. See, what matters is in sport, and I don't know you guys know the difference between an aim and a goal. An aim is why you do something. For example, winning. Okay. Now, Grant Hackett broke a world record a couple of years ago, came second to a guy named Thorpe. Now, if you break a world record, but don't win. You haven't failed, have you? Mm, no. Now, he did not achieve his aim. His aim was winning, his aim getting selected, all those are things. My aim today is that at the end of this podcast, you say, I've helped you and your listeners. Mm, yeah. But I can't guarantee that. Some of your people might be saying, listen, we've already sold our um, cow, so we have no use for your bull now. I mean, I can't guarantee that you want to listen. Mm. But what I can do, and this is what a goal is, the goal is, what things do I have to do to give me the greatest chance of achieving my aim? Going back to the goal kicking. Your aim 
is put the ball between the two posts. But you can't guarantee that the wind, especially over in, well, it used to be at Subiaco where the wind was really cr crazy there. You know, it's hard to kick the goal. But you say, did I do the things? So that midfielder, I got him to make sure his goal to go through the actions that gave him the highest chance of kicking a goal. There was no 100% guarantee. Mm -hmm. A team could do everything right and lose. But the thing is, did you do the things you want? So at the end of this, I want to achieve my aim. Now, one of the things that I teach in sport is you never want to have regret. You can have disappointment. Regret is where you know you didn't execute. Disappointment is you executed and didn't get the result. For example, mm -hmm. I might be in sales, do everything right, but the guy wants to buy from his mother-in-law, whatever. Uh, and so the thing in sport, you want to at the end of the game, say, I executed at the best of my ability. Yes, I made mistakes at sport. Yes, the opposition at times did better than me. But at the end of the game, I played the game I could play, and I ticked the box that I tried to achieve my goals. I remember Nigel Lappin years ago, um, he, we, we had talked about in sport and Aussie rules, uh, basketball and soccer, the three second rule is really important because in those games you get what's called a turnover where you go from attack to defense, defense to attack and most players go one, two, three and then they change which gives the opposition a few me meters to get because they moved. Nigel always said I'm going to make sure I have the one second rule and Ma Nigel, we'll talk about profiles or so. Nigel's a guy who never believed in himself but always yeah. performed well. Self doubt, wasn't he? And so that's what, yeah, but he was such a great person. Great he said, I'm going to make sure that if I use the one second rule, even though I don't believe in myself, I'll perform well. Yeah. And how often did you see Nigel during his career chase somebody down from behind mm -hmm. or converse and he was open in front? when the turnover happened. That's because yeah. he said, I can control the one second rather than three seconds. Regardless of how Whereas most players, well, you know, it takes a while for you to see that happen. You know, it's not my fault. You know, it takes a while to get into it. Mm. And so the good players made sure. Michael Jordan's never played better in finals. What he did is made sure he kept the same level and let the adrenaline in the finals make him play better. But he yeah. made sure I do those actions that I do when I'm a winner rather than doing the actions that I do when I'm a loser. And that's the difference between winners and losers. Winners always say, is what I'm doing getting me to where I want to get? Losers say, um, well, it's not my fault. I had a professional player in the Davis Cup years ago, tennis player. And I said, why do you throw the racket down? He says, I got angry. I said, what's your next point like when you throw the racket down? It's bad. I said, when you see the opponent throw the racket down, what do you think? Oh, it's good because I'm winning. And I waited for him to understand, and he didn't. And he's <laughs> no longer in the Davis Cup. Um, whereas you get somebody like I've worked with um, Tomic and uh, Kyrgios and Milman, and I guarantee the player I want my team is Milman. Less talented than those other two, hmm. but he always plays 80 to 90% of his 100%, which might be those other two guys' 80%. Mm -hmm. But I'd rather a player giving me 80-90% of his 100% than have some super stud that sometimes his playing is 90% wonderful, but other times it's 30%. And so one of the things I try to teach people, how can you make sure that you keep playing at that 80-90%? You'll never get 100% because sport, you make mistakes, you get fatigued, you get hit, whatever. It's getting people to do that. And so when you look at somebody like uh, Nigel, after a game, he almost never had regret. He had disappointments. And that's what you want in your players. That's yeah. what in your coaches. As a matter of fact, I often say that losers have what's called an if-only message. You know, and when I say if-only, I wouldn't say if-only I was talking to you guys right now, because I am. So when somebody says, if only the umpire was better, what they're saying is I feel good about failing because the umpire is no good. If only the weather was better, uh, I feel good about failing because of the weather. And I often talk about the difference between a winner and a loser. A loser would say, I dropped the fall, ball because it was raining. The winner would say, I need to practice wet football so the next time it rains I can catch it. Mm. And so that it's the idea of saying any time, like for example, if I say to you, Andrew, after a game, Andrew, you had a bad game, but don't worry about it. You're a good guy. I like you. I want you to be positive. I haven't done you a favor, have I? No. We've got to say, what were your handbrakes to playing well that game? What can you do to make it better? Because it's a basic law of physics. 
for things to change, things have to change. Yeah. So unless you go back to your plan A. And so that's why uh, after a grand fall in rugby league here, uh, Brisbane, uh, sorry, uh, South, who Wayne Bennett was coaching, were playing Penrith. And they lost so one pass. Anyway, after the game, Wayne said, but the journalist didn't understand. He said, I'm really proud of my players because they had only had disappointment. They didn't have regret. In other words, it was a great football game. You make mistakes. That's sport. But that's what you want. At the end of the game, you look at your teammates and say, we don't have regret. We have disappointment. It's sad. The ball bounced and go our way. Didn't know that. And the real key is that when I talk to players, ask them, do you understand why you had regret? And I ask players, why'd you have a bad game? And they say, oh, I wasn't prepared. So if I said before the game, are you prepared? Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, my head was in the right place. Where's it up your bum? I mean, what, you know, all these <laughs> things that they say. And see, nobody understands the key of why we play badly. And the reason is we turned our computers off. And one of the reasons I'll talk about the profiles later on, as I mentioned, my computer is speak quickly, tell bad jokes. Now I know if I slow down and talk like this and try to be <laughs> serious and get some <laughs> notes out so I can read, I will suck. I was running my I, story, true story, about 18 years ago, my son Timothy was playing indoor soccer. He was 18 and he broke his elbow and he got it rewired. And our house, we have like two tiers and a flat. And so we have carpeted steps. And he's coming down the carpeted steps and we just washed them. And he slipped. So to protect his elbow, he twisted, fell down, hit a pot plant, severed his kidney. I see you. Now, fortunately, a rhinologist saved his kidney, which is good. But anyway, I was writing this two-day course the next day. And I was speaking about Timothy, but I was speaking quickly, telling bad jokes. And somebody said, how can you be so upbeat with your son in hospital? I said, would it help me to be downbeat? No. Would it help Timothy be downbeat? No. Would it help you if you're downbeat? No. So why should we be downbeat? Everybody knows. <laughs> when they don't feel good, you can't act good. I said, okay, people, let's imagine. Everybody here is so depressed. Life sucks so much. You need three straws and a fire <laughs> breaks out. And you know if you don't leave, you're going to die an excruciating, horrible death. How many of you would say, well, I would leave, but I'm depressed. I'll wait till I feel better. Mm -hmm. Or conversely, I say, listen, people, let's be positive. I tell you, I've got a bar of gold bullion for each one of you outside, but you got to get it within 160 seconds. How many say, well, I would get it, but I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. Wait till I feel better. And you see the looks in their faces? See, we have this horrible conspiracy that's been taught if your head is not positive, you can't perform. So you get coaches, psychologists trying to get their players positive, mm. which is a sad thing because now that player is saying, I'm not positive now, so I can't perform. I get journalists asking me about athletes all the time. How can that athlete play with all these off-field issues? I say, what skills doesn't he have? What? Kicking, chasing? Catching, what doesn't he have? Well, he's upset. And you see, there's rubbish. She says, there's only four reasons why we fail. Number one, I don't know what to do. Now, when you've had a bad game, you knew what to do, didn't you? Number two, you didn't know how to do it. Like I mentioned, I can never be out of, real, out of form and all the rules because I can't kick. <laughs> all right? Number three, you don't have the ability. Want to see my vertical leap? Want to see it again? In other words, that's why I'm a psychologist. I have no ability. But see, when I was angry, when I was jealous, when I didn't like the referee, I knew what, how, and ability to treat those people with dignity, didn't I? Mm -hmm. All right? That midfielder knew how to kick accurately to goal. He knew what to do. He had the ability to do it. So the key here is, why wouldn't he do it? And that takes us to fourth reason. That's where I come in. Why would we choose to fail. It makes no sense. Why would you change how you kick when you know kicking makes it worse? And one of the things I always teach is never try to impress because when you impress you change. When you change you turn your computer off. Mm -hmm. And I got really annoyed. I, was, I used to go to every AFL draft camp every year. And, uh, but while I was there they used to get me to talk to the coaches doing their level threes. And uh, you might remember in our days 
Port, uh, Adelaide were actually better than us most years. Mm-hmm. And yet they never even got in the grand final for a couple of years. And Simon Hawthorne was better than us. But we, we kept our computers on, they turned our computers off. And because I remember the Scott brothers went and played golf the day before the, you know, you weren't supposed to do that, yeah. you're supposed to focus so on the forth. grand final and mm-hmm. so forth. And uh, anyway, Chalk was at this, and Chalk used to always get his players to get rid of hyper and whatever. He was at that meeting. Anyway, the next year, guess what? We're playing Port in the grand final. And yes, I understand. We had to play uh, Geelong on Saturday night in Melbourne. Melbourne. And right. Port got to play on Friday night in Port, even though we we're higher than them. But I won't go into politics. Anyway, no. <laughs> he didn't get his players hyped that time. He used to always get his players hyped. They yeah, were calm. And they kicked yeah. our butts. Absolutely mm-hmm. kicked our butts that game. And I said, well, I shouldn't teach coaches. But the mm-hmm. point about that was, you see, coaches somehow think that the more important the game it is, you need to change. See, if I have a microphone in front of me, the only difference of the microphone is like, when I'm talking to you now, I'm talking at normal voice. If I have an audience of 2,000, I need a microphone. Mm-hmm. But I don't change. I don't say, well, I got a microphone. I got to talk a bit different now. <laughs> so why should somebody do differently? Now, one of the illustrations I give of this, in my office here, uh, it's rectangular. If I put a plank here, and let's assume you guys are here, and I said, I want you to walk the plank without touching the carpet. Dead easy. Piece of cake. Now I put the same plank outside, 10 stories up. No netting, no strapping. Take a gun to your heads. Say, I want to walk the plank. Now you're going to be thinking, I don't want to die. Now if I say, don't think of an apple, what do you think of? Uh-huh. Apple. Just like the player kicking for gold. Don't miss. Uh-huh. You're thinking, miss. Anyway, what happens is, you actually change what you do because it's important, which is really stupid. Because here, when you walk the carpet, you had about a 3% chance of falling because you go faster, which keeps you from going sideways, whatever. So what do you do 10 stories up? You lean back, you look down, and you go slower. Now let's imagine that you guys are my 800 meter runner in the Olympics and you're in the final. And I say, hey guys, Andrew, Harry, you got here using plan A. If you use plan A tomorrow, you got a 97% chance of getting gold. But since it's really important, let's go to plan Z, which gives you 53%. Now, you'd fire me as a coach, wouldn't you? <laughs> Who's the best coach we all get? It's ourselves, isn't it? Yep. Now, it's important to understand why would you lean back and go slow when it gives you a higher chance of dying? Why would you look at the ball, keep your shoulders next to your pelvis when you're kicking for goal when it's more important than kicking to a player? And see, people don't understand why they make that choice. Mm. And that's my role today. Now, I know I'm talking a lot. Do you mind me talking without you asking questions? No, we, uh, we prepared this for right? this moment. We're when the guest is talking, yeah, we're we happy. It. Okay, so there's basically three rules of the brain about failing and success. And I, a few years ago, I had to go up to Warwick in, here in Queensland to work with the Australian polo cross team. Now, I'd never even heard of the sport. Apparently, it's lacrosse on horses, okay? Anyway, now, if I was a great equestrian and a great lacrosse player, I still couldn't play polo cross because I need to know the rules. Now, the most important game is the game of life, and yet nobody teaches us the rules. I had a high school here, uh, and they had this thing called mates talk change, so if you're depressed, you talk to a mate. Problem is, Mm. when they talk to the mate, the mate didn't know what to say. And so they got me there to talk to them. I had a primary school, grade three is the sixth, and they can understand it. A baseball player said to me once, it's not rocket surgery. I find it hard to say rocket science anymore. But the thing (laughs) about it is, it's really simple when you understand why we fail. All right, number one rule. What's the purpose of pain? Let's assume you're walking in my office now and you're barefoot, and you step on a thumbtack. Why will you get pain? Because it's telling you not to do it. Because you're not doing the right it's thing. It's telling you if you keep doing it, it's going to get worse, right? Mm. Now, you know, in your foot, there's no pain receptacles. So pain's all in your brain. So if you anesthetize the neurons from the foot to the brain, you won't feel anything. Or if you had leprosy or Hansen's disease, you wouldn't feel pain. But that's no good. Pain is very, very important. Because when you get pain, the brain says what you're doing is not working. The last thing I want to do is anesthetize that tack because I won't pull it out. Yeah. Now, even when I pull the thumbtack out, it still hurts because the brain says, no, there's still danger. could be infected. So the pain is very, very useful. Now, if I just had a stone in my shoe 
empty the stone up, there's no more pain. So the basic thing is our brain is our slave. And it says, Master, anytime what you're doing is not working, I'm going to give you pain. Now going back to you guys in all the rules, when you're kicking to a player, it feels good. Correct? Absolutely. Because what you're doing is accurate. Yep. When you're kicking for goal and you're going to that other rub, you're lifting up your socks. Doesn't feel good, does it? Mm -hmm. So your brain says the way you're kicking for goal is not working. Now that's really important, isn't it? The last thing I want you to do is be positive about your kicking style and kicking badly. Because either your kicking style is accurate or it's not. I mean, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Now, where I disagree with my colleagues, I think all pain is good. Now, right now in my office, if a fire starts at my feet and the alarm goes above me, which do I turn off first, the alarm or the fire? The fire, correct? Yeah. Pretty straightforward. Now, what happens is if I have a physiological disease, then they make sure that the, they say pain is good. Now, if I go to a doctor and say, listen, I think I'm cancerous, will you give me drugs? He won't. Because he or she says, we have to give you tests because before we can find the cure, we need to find the cause. When I broke my wrist a couple years ago, they didn't just put a cast on, they'd say, we need to give you an x-ray to make sure that by immobilizing the wrist in a cast, it's still gonna heal. But if I go to a doctor and say, listen, my marriage is breaking up, they'll give me a prescription. But there's nothing wrong with me. So what's the difference? What happens is, if you can find the cause, Everybody says we need, before we try to fix you, we need to find the cause so we can diagnose the cure. If you have a condition, now as I mentioned before, if you can't see it, you can't fix it. I never talk about an attitude of discipline. For example, depressing. I never use the word depression. Depressing is like being on a water ski, being on a motorboat. The only thing you don't want the motorboat to do is stop, because when you stop, you sink, and it feels bad. So depressing, anxiety, stressing, or all emotions we get when the way we're handling things aren't working. Mm -hmm. I had a real estate agent come to me a few years ago and he said, oh, my life's spiraling out of control. I said, what's happening? He said, oh, my wife left me. That's no good. But what have you changed? What do you mean? Your brain's giving you pain, so the way you're handling your wife leaving is not working. So I said, what did you used to do before you, when you felt good? Well, I go for a run every morning, have a nutritious breakfast, when I got to work, I would chat to three people, I told a few jokes, made three phone calls to clients, and if was nobody in the office, got out on the road. Good. So what are you doing now? I'm not going for a run. Not having a nutritious breakfast. Matter of fact, having a bit of hooge. Not making not jokes, not ringing up people, not getting in the road. I said, how does that feel bad? I said, go out to plan A. Mm. Week later, he said, it's amazing. My, wife, my life's so much better, and my wife's willing to talk to me now. See, what had happened is anytime you change what's working, bring his pain, leaning backwards, on that plank 10 stories up felt bad. So if somebody says I'm not enjoying my footing now, what do I know? The way you're handling your footing now is not working. And so it's important we embrace the pain. So if I go to a doctor saying my knee's hurting, he will actually give me more pain. Even physios, they love saying, does this hurt? No, no. When they finally find it hurts, they push harder. They're like, ah! I think they're from the Inquisition days. Anyway, but they're not really being cruel. That pain is helping them find the cause so they can find the cure. And even when I'm doing some of my rehab, if it starts hurting, I say, if you say, that's hurting, okay, you must be doing it wrong. Because the pain, the brain is saying the way you're doing it is not making it better. Which is good. But if I go to a doctor and say, I'm depressing, he'll say, oh, this is a condition. Since we don't know where the fire is, we'll turn off the alarm. And he says, you need to take time off work, so I'm going to stop more. Don't worry. I'll give you an antidepressant so you can't feel it. Now, I understand if my depressing was hormonal cause, by all means, you can find by testing my blood. You can, if it's a neurological thing, you can find it. But where there's no cause, what they do is that since we can't find the cause, we have to give you palliative care. You know palliative care where we can't cure you but we'll make you feel comfortable? Now, it really worries me when people are medicating without telling me why am I upset. And when people come to me, they always come to me in pain. See, nobody comes to me and say, listen, my marriage is great, my sport's great, my business is great. When people come to me, they're in pain, which is saying what I'm doing now is not working. So you got rule number one, pain is good. 
So if you're an athlete and you're saying to me, hey, coach, I'm not enjoying my footy, I say, okay, we, we're doing something wrong here. All right? As a coach, I remember one time I was with a rugby league coach in the coach's box, and a player did something really stupid, and he was getting angry. I said, mate, you have an if-only message. See, rather than if-only messages, what we have to have is only if. Only if I do what? Can I make this obstacle an opportunity? Only if I do what? Make this problem a potentiality? So I said to him, mate, what you got to ask yourself is only if I do what can help that player make better decisions next time. Because when you make a mistake on the footy field, you're not trying to lose. You actually thought it was a good, good decision, but it wasn't. You had a skill error, or you misjudged it. All of those are fixable. And so he not only didn't get angry, but they won the premiership that year. Because from then on, any time he felt pain as a coach, he said, aha, the way I'm coaching at the moment is not working. I need to change it so our players perform better. That's pretty simple stuff. Okay, rule number two is that where do bad thoughts come from? For example, you know sometimes you get thoughts and you wish you didn't? When I ask players this, and anybody, they don't know. Now we all have is what I call the front desk secretary of the brain. It's actually called the brain stem particular formation, but footy players find that a bit big. What happens is our brain says, Master, I don't know what thoughts you want and what thoughts you don't want. So the way the brain works that out, it says, I'll, when I give you a thought, if you act on it, I'll make the thought louder. When you don't act on it, I'll make the thought softer. So if you had an icy cold water, and the brain says, get out, it's cold, and you keep swinging. The brain says, get out, it's cold, you keep swinging. The brain says, get out, it's cold, keep... it turns off the temperature. Because the brain said, I gave you the thought, didn't act on it. But if I get out right away, put my toe in, it actually feels colder. Because the brain says, you know how to cold it is. See, if I'm your secretary, and I give you a message from Fred Bloggs, and you don't ring him, I give you another message, Fred Bloggs, you don't ring him. Give you a third message, Fred Bloggs, ring somebody else. Then I'll stop giving the message. And that's where the brain works. So if every time the phone rings, I pick up a cigarette, the brain says, Master, as soon as the phone rings, Master, you need nicotine. Master, you need nicotine. But if every time the phone rang, I pick up a carrot, as soon as the phone rings, the brain says, Master, you need carotene. Master, you need Now, I get neither nicotine nor carotene cravings because I don't smoke, and I've never eaten a carrot on the phone. And so I used to live in a refinery and couldn't smell it. People say, how do you handle the pot? I couldn't smell it because I didn't react. You get these girls putting on some perfume and they smell like a perfume factory. Or us guys say hi and it peels the paint off the wall. And when I say, why can't we smell it? Well, you see, when you put perfume on, you don't go, Poisson and Pulse. When's the last time halfway through a workout you smelled your armpit? Oh, yeah, it feels good. I mean, you don't do that. So we can't smell it. And so that's the way it worked. By the way, where do mistakes come from? Practice. I cannot make the mistakes and all the rules that you guys make. I've never practiced. I never accidentally swear in Russian. I don't speak Russian. But if I swear like a trooper all my life, become a priest and say, here's the effing Eucharist, haven't worked out probably not a word that you use in church. If an intimate moment with my wife, I use the wrong name, what you gonna know? I've been practicing, as if any woman would put up with me. But my point about that is, that's why I really find it interesting in all the rules, you get these guys practicing banana kicks at the end of training. Now how often do you get a banana kick in a game? Next to never. How often do guys shank the ball when they should kick it straight? Why? Because they practiced the shank by a banana kick. You know? So that, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why would you do that? And so this is a very important rule because if you don't want a bad thought, don't act badly. And I, I tell people, as you saw, and I stand up, I like to watch my weight, so keep it where I can watch it. Um, I used to go bike riding with my mates every weekend before I broke my wrist, about 80K. And the first K out, my brain would say, listen, you're a 70 year old bastard, too old to be doing this. Heart's thump, thump, thump. Everything's telling me to slow down, breathing heavily, but I pedal harder. At the end of 80K, I was less tired than one, despite more lactic acid, dehydrogen. You've had the same thing. 10 minutes of training session, you're knackered. An hour later, you're less tired. And the brain said, I gave you the time. That's why you train. So the brain says, you don't want tired feelings. And one of the things I guarantee in Aussie rules, because of your continual interchange, players get tired sooner than they did in my day. Because they knew they weren't going to come off very often. And so the more you go like this, and the coach brings you off, the brain says, oh, you like being tired. Whereas the more you don't act tired, the brain says, you don't like being tired. And it's amazing watching these teams where they get some injuries, and they can't have the interchange, and yet they still can play. But it took them a while for the brain says, oh no, tiredness is okay. You can play while tired. 
Okay, so this is important. Now, I had a, a girl come to me years ago, but she put an article in the Korea Mail track and field. She was in the Tokyo Olympics, but she came to me as 12, 13 year old. And I said to her, why are you here? She says, oh, I get really nervous. Now, I'll talk about this in a second, but nerves are just fuel. You want fuel. The fuel in your car is good. Just don't take a match to it. So the bigger the match, the more fuel. You had more fuel 10 stories up than you did down here. Now, fuel is good. She said, I said, that's normal. She said, no, I vomit. I said, that's not good. I said, what do you do when you drive to the track? And her profile is like me called Mozzie Feeler. What do you do when you drive to the track with your parents? She said, I talk rubbish at the lower meets. Talk rubbish, run around. And when I get there, I run around. And that's when you run fast and don't vomit. To go to the important meets, what do you do? I'm quiet. And what do you do when you get there? I'm quiet. So let's see if we got this right. When you talk rubbish, run around, run fast and don't vomit. When you're quiet and run around, um, you run slowly and vomit. What did you do tomorrow going to Queensland track me? She says, I'll go back to plan A. She broke three Queensland records. And the courier mail, she said, one of the things Phil Jones taught me was well, embrace nerves. Just don't go to plan Z. I had a squash player, professional squash player, said, oh, Phil, sometimes you get really down in between games, you know, in the hallway. I said, I want you to get a doll's mirror and make the ugliest face you can. Because <laughs> when you make an ugly face, you can't feel bad. She said it worked so well that um, when she uh, uh, made a mistake in a game, she'd make the ugly face of the girl. She got in the top ten. I told Brad Hall, I said, mate, when you take yourself seriously, you don't bowl well. Stick your tongue out. People say, why do you stick your tongue out? Well, I'd like to pay bowl for Australia. See, by not sticking his tongue out, he turned his computer off. So this takes us to the third rule. How do you keep your computer on? Now, the brain says, anytime I do give you something important, I give you more fuel. But when I give you more fuel, your first reaction is to go to plan Z. I was riding my push bike down a hill here, and with my wave, it's going about 55K, and a ute with extended mirrors bumps the bike, bike starts wobbling. And I must have lent backwards, because whenever you lean backwards, your computer goes off. And the um, brain said, slow down. Now, what's the worst thing you can do if you're in a wobble? Slow down. When you're 10 stories up, what's the worst thing you can do if you don't want to fall sideways? Slow down. And what was your instincts to do? Slow down. Now, fortunately, if your battery's dead, doesn't start your starter motor, doesn't get your engine going, doesn't get your prop set going, doesn't get your wheels going, you reverse the process. You push the car, get the wheels going, get the prop shaft prop, prop going, engage her and you have a man who engages the clutch, starts the engine, charges the battery. And so this is the prob, pr purpose of positive doing. You say, what would I be doing if I felt good? And the brain says, if you get that right, I'll have to do better. But if you don't do that, first I'll give you pain, but if you don't do that, I'll help you self-sabotage. And so you see a player leaning back when he feels bad, he drops the next ball. He can't do what he wanted to do. And so I had this racing driver come to me years ago and he said, oh Phil, I was racing over in Beijing and I got really nervous and I raced badly. He said, what did you change? I said, what do you mean? What did you change? Oh, he says, when I raced well, um, I um, walked the track before the race and then what I do is I uh, talk a lot of the two-way. So what did you do in Beijing? I didn't walk the track, didn't talk with the two-way. And I looked up and saw my hands are higher in the steering wheel. I said, uh, your computer was off. He said, yeah. So I have to go back to plan A. He won four of the next five races. He now always walks the track before a race and he wins more. Than so again, he still has disappointment. He loses races with mechanical failures and so forth, but he doesn't have regret. But in Beijing, he had regret. I had a ex-world champion surfer come and he said, oh, Phil, I do really well in the heats, bad in the finals. So what did you change? He said, well, in the heats, I just pick up the board, look where I'm going, take the first wave. What do you do in the finals? I focus, emo, because when you focus, where does your weight go? Back. He said, what What I do, and um, then I check the boards out, and then I look at the opposition, and see what they do first. See, we've got this straight. When you don't look at the board, don't look at the opposition, take first wave, score high. When you do look at the boards, do look at the opposition, don't take first wave, score low. What do you want to do tomorrow? Go back to plan A, one Bell's Beach. I had another surfer come up to me, and I'll take the earphone again. Another surfer come up to me, and he said, oh, Phil, I get really scared surfing at Tahiti, you know, those really high waves. I said, how do you surf when you're not scared? He said, like this. How do you surf when you're scared? Like this. I said, go like this. He said, that it? I said, yes. Now, he actually brought another surfer to me the other day. Now, I can't surf. 
But see, what happens is you watch people what they do. Now, again, I've only ever played social cricket. I wouldn't know how to bat. But a Bangladeshi batsman come to me, oh, Dr. Phil, I get out in the nervous 90s. I said, how do you bat in the non-nervous 80s? Oh, I lean forward. And notice when he leans forward, the bat's higher. Because when you're feeling good in cricket, you have two thoughts. Am I going to hit it or not? Once I hit it, I let the computer hit it. Now, when the ball hits it, the computer, I don't watch the ball hit the bat. Go there. Now, I said, what do you do in the nervous 90s? Oh, I lean back. And I don't look down. When I'm feeling good, I move around between balls. I don't move around. You see, we've got this straight. When you lean forward, look up. Move around between balls. You score runs and don't get out. When you lean back, look down. Watch the ball hit the bat. Look for fielders. You get out. What should you do next time you get nervous 90s? Oh, Dr. Phil, plan A. He scored three centuries in that World Cup, and I can't bat. All right? So these are little things. Uh, Damien Martin told me in uh, cricket, he said, I really helped him because I've worked out, when you go to battle, you always keep your armor before you, and his bat was his armor, and said, so when he walked out the middle of the bat in front of me, computer's on, computer off. Now let's imagine that I worked in music, matter of fact, the University of Melbourne did a study of my stuff, and said, Phil, we're really surprised uh, uh, in music that the pe not the people you worked with did better than people who didn't, but the fact that the same men performance anxiety, they ex thought anxiety was bad. Now if I'm leaning like this, practicing in the mirror, that's my plan A. But as soon as I go to Carnegie Hall to play, I'm going to be tenth. Just go like this. But all I have to do is go like this, and I reboot my computer. And that's where the profiles come into it. The profiles are, what are you guys doing when you're plan A? Now, my profile is what's called Mozzie Feeler. Now, we don't have time to go through all of that, but Mozzie means buzzing around. Now, Rainsy, you got Mozzie in you. So when you get serious, you suck. If you're just having fun, not planning, instinctive fun. Now, on the other hand, and I'll, I'll get, get this. This is Rainsy's profile. Can you see it there? Okay. That means he's got a lot of Mozzie and some enforcer. Now, people above the line, they, their great strength is they learn by talking, by doing, and after a game, we don't want to debrief, we're going to go to the next game. Now, the people opposite, if that had been your profile, Nigel Lappin type profile, they need to think about it, they're quiet, so that people above the line, your first tackle is the best tackle. People below the line, takes them a while to get into the game. So, so the brain says we need to allocate how we're going. And so that's pretty important. So that um, with profiles, it helps you understand. So when, I th when we first started walking players on the sidelines, and the, that was originally, when I go to new sports, I always ask them why you do things. For example, originally in all the rules, you had one coach in the, in the stands watching the game, making field placements, and you didn't have any interchange. And so you didn't need to go down. Once interchange came, got more coaches, they stayed in the stands as well. And I used to walk the players mainly because we found if you, when you come off, if you walk 50 meters, the lactic acid quickly goes down. But also, you know, those days come off, and usually when you got off, you're in trouble. Yeah. All right? And so you get these players come out, you know, didn't want to listen. So we'd actually let them walk, come back, and relax them. But one of the things we'd talk about, they say, hey, Blackie, I noticed you're not in plan A. And because they understood that, when they went back on, yeah, let's go back to our plan A. What's our plan A? And it helps them. So with Blackie, who had a profile very similar to Rainsy here, he had to be talking, moving, all right? chatting, whatever. Whereas if Nigel was quiet, I wouldn't worry about that because that's his thing. He's just making sure I stick to my two-second rule, make sure I stick to my structures. Now, we get a tell of the hun here, Harry. Now, as you can see, he's got a lot of enforcer. Now, Mozzie's buzz, enforcer, we need to get our goal aggressive, and thinker, structure. See all the flexibility? Zero. All right, no flexibility. Whereas, Rainsy, you're much more flexible. And that means that Rainsy, the way you learn, Andrew, is by why. As a coach, if I tell you what to do. So, in sporting terms, people on this side learn shape. We need to learn the shape, and the structure takes care of its place itself. People on... Harry side, you learn structure. You need to know what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Now, the thing is that when you're going well, you're assertive. The problem is, I remember Martin Pike, who had a profile like yours, and we're coming off, and a player 
was uh, a fan was yelling some abuse at him. And Pike told him in no uncertain words uh, how to get uh, intercourse. And uh, I said, Pikey, you just made that player's day, or that fan's day. But later, Brad Scott was coming off. And a fan had to go on him. Now, Scotty has a lot of thinker in him and force him. And uh, Scotty smiled at me. I'm not going to make his day. See, Pikey, as an enforcer, reacted instinctively without thinking about it. Scott was more thoughtful, Brad, organized in what he did. And so that's why I go through profiles. So that if either of you, if you came into me, Harry said, listen, late, I'm getting a lot of suspensions. I remember years ago, Jonathan Brown, a similar profile, was being sent off. And uh, not sent off, but getting a lot of penalties and getting some suspensions. And Lee Matthews said, I want you to talk to Brownie about his anger. And he said, um, I said to Brownie, we don't have to deal with your anger, we have to deal with your reaction to your anger. Now, in Aussie rules, if you keep your hands open, all right, and below your shoulders, you can't get penalized. It's very, very hard. I said, you have to do something worthwhile. So when you get an angry, just do something legal. Anyway, the very next game, there was a bit of a brawl, and he grabbed Chris Scott. And Scotty said, I'm your teammate. And Brownie said, but it's legal. Now, Brownie never got another suspension in his whole career. I remember Jamie Charman, and we had a, a coach, and uh, he said to Jamie, because Jamie get really angry, and the coach said to him, Scotty MacGyver, he said, listen, pinch his nipple, because it's legal. And uh, players still say to Charman nowadays, you still pinch nipples? Because in a game, he get angry, go, Pfft. and you can't get suspended for that. You're not going to get a penalty for pinching. Now, I thought it was pretty bizarre, and I've never heard it doing before, and I'm not Telling the coaches listening here that tell your players to do that when they're angry. But you see, you can't control anger, but you can control acting angrily. I've used up a lot of your time. You see, the time's moving on. As you can see, you know, getting me to talk's like getting a drunk to drink. It's not hard. Um, so, Phil, I just wanted to ask you about that play, plan A and Z. You mentioned yours was talking fast and telling bad jokes. For someone listening out there who's not going well with their footy, how do they find out what their plan A is? Um, is it trial and error, or do they need a, or well, is yeah, someone observing them? Both. You, you, what, what I do is actually get people, and I say, listen, now, I'm lucky because I can actually do the profile. I can guesstimate it. So I have a tennis player here the other day, mm. and I saw her profile, and I said, oh, this is what you do when it works. And he said, yeah. But if you don't have that experience, all you have to do is put a videotape in your mind. When I had a good game, what did I do in the dressing room? When I had a bad game, what I do in dressing before the game. And I actually get kids used to do a little spreadsheet, an Excel sheet when I work with high school kids at uh, schools of excellence of sport. So what do you do with your parents when you go into the event? Tennis, golf, whatever it might be. What's your A, what's your yep. Z? When you get there, what's your A, what's your Z? Because they always know when I'm having a bad game, what am I doing? And I actually had one golfing girl, 14-year-old, and uh, I've only got three problems in my golf game. Can't putt, chip, or drive other than I'm all right. But uh, anyway, we're at the Victorian golf links so with are really long, whole, high hills and stuff. And she shagged the ball off the tee. And I was with the golf pro at the top. And she looked up at me, because she was getting grumpy. She looked at me, she smiled, put the golf club in front of her, hit the ball this far from the cup. And the pro said, I've never seen her do that before. But see, she consciously worked out, when she feels good, she swaggers. When she feels bad, she doesn't swagger. So some people, when you feel good, it's quiet. When you don't, it's not. For example, I recently went to the funeral of uh, Andrew Simons, and we were talking about the profiles there, and they're all saying, Roy, and he got quiet, we'd have, have a go at him, tell him a joke, play a practical joke on him, because that re rebooted his computer. And so your teammates often know what mm. your plans they mm. are. You look at your teammate, and you say, he's not going to play well today. Mm. And you know that. So just ask other people. Or if they're young, ask your parents. What are you doing when it's good? I find when I have parents with me, I'm talking to young kids about their planning, they said, they know. When he or she does that, mm -hmm. computer's on. And it's just it's looking different. at what you're doing and you'll instinctively do it. Now the simple thing about it is, usually when you feel good, when you stand up, I'm right-handed, so I'll go back here again. When I feel good, when I'm just having a conversation, I will naturally have my left foot slightly forward because it's for balance. For example, I had an 11-year-old kid here. I said, I said, why are you here? He says, I got angry in the tennis court. So why do you get angry? Because I'm playing badly. How do you play when you get angry? Worse. So let me get show me. I gave him a tennis racket. How do you stand when you're not angry? He was in stance. We can see, because I'm so right-handed, when I put this foot forward, it means I hit the ball balance. Serve balance. I said, how do you stand when you get angry? 
he went back to the parallel and is leaning back. So now when he sits, he's coming across and serving too high. And so what it is, is that I get people to look at themselves. What do you do? And I actually have parents now of kids and they'll just yell out, Plan A! Reminding them, reboot your computer. Now it may not be instantly, but I remember a few years ago I was watching uh, Sammy Stosa who was ranked eighth in the world and she couldn't win in Australia three years in a row uh, for a year before she lost three tournaments in the first round including the Australian Open the next year she lost the first two tournaments in the first round but in the th Australian Open she won the first round but in the second round she was up in the third set 5-2 40 love she said but I got negative thoughts and I couldn't get rid of them. I lost the, the game and then I lost the match and took me three months to get back into it. But see, the mistake she made was when she got negative thoughts, she leant back, turned her computer off. Now, if I'm ranked eighth in the world computer off and I'm playing somebody ranked 80th in the world computer on, the 80th is going to win. Mm. And so it's all about asking yourself, what am I doing? And it's not just in sport. When I come home, when I'm feeling good, what do I say when I get there? When I walk in the dressing room, when I'm feeling good, what am I doing with bad? I actually had a rugby league player just the other day. I said, show me how you sit at halftime when you're feeling good. It's like this. Show me how you sit when you think you've had a bad game. Like this. So now go like this. I said, how long did that take? He said, that quick. And so it's all about looking at yourself at, like a videotape of yourself and say, what am I doing to feel good? And with the professionals, I actually get them to look at videos of players and say, let's watch him away from the ball on a good game and away from the ball on a bad game. And you'll find A and Z. It sticks out, you know, mm. like a pimple on a baby's bum. I mean, you can just see it so easily. Any young listeners out there can tell that, or parents listening, um, you know, tell that aboard. You, you know, you know, sort of straight away what your sort of plan A is. But it's it's a good question, Harry, to sort of try and get them in that sort of zone of thinking. Just a, another one, Phil. Round it was probably more around your, your first couple of points or your section one where we broke down in the power of positive doing. Mm -hmm. um, one of my, it's not my pet hate, and I went, it's but it's it's up there. Is so many clubs and organisations have, and they've got to have them trademarks and behaviours and all sorts of stuff, and the, a lot of them are words. Um, does it blow your mind that you talk about the doing? Why wouldn't they have, you know, action? I know that a few of them do have actions, but a lot of them you walk in ruthless, respected, all that sort of stuff. Or as you spoke about, sometimes they're more emotions of actually words instead of actually actions of doing. Have you have you delved into much of that space and, and understand sort of why clubs do a lot of that? Absolutely. Matter of fact, I find nowadays it's always going to be absolutely 100%. But uh, modern jargon. Mm. But no, I, I remember years ago, Wayne Bennett, a rugby league coach, was going down to St. George, and he said, Phil, I want to get a high-performance team, and I want to get a high-performance culture. But he said, you can't see culture. So he said, what I'm going to do is get the leadership team together, mm. and what's the evidence of a high-performance team? What's the evidence of a low-performance mm. team? And, and what's the consequences of not giving evidence? And you say, I can lie about being a loving dad, but I can't lie about giving evidence of being a loving dad. And so a lot of these times when people use words, you can lie. Oh, I'm ruthless. You know, I got a great attitude and all that sort of stuff. That's garbage. It's always going to be evidence based. Mm. And so without evidence, you, you can flatter yourself. You won't get there. I remember years ago in the Queensland Bulls, we'd never won a Sheffield Shield for 87 years. And they got this thing that they helped, I helped write up. What's the Bulls way? And it was all evidences that if you want to be a successful team, mm. evidences. And I told him a story about Wayne Bennett, a player one time came late to a planning session, third time. And he followed Wayne to the coach's office. And the player said, sorry, Wayne. Wayne said, you don't have to apologize. Why don't you have to apologize? You're not a Bronco anymore. You dropping me? No, you dropped yourself. Hmm. Broncos are on time. You're not on time. You're not a Bronco. And so these players said in the Bulls, cricket, if we don't do these things, we don't want to be here. And they all signed it, got laminated. Everybody got a copy, but they kept it in the dressing room. And every so often somebody would do something and the captain, you know, Alan Border, Ian Healy would just point to it. Hey guys. And it was all about evidence. Because you can't lie about evidence. Mm. Well, you can lie to yourself that we're ruthless, you know, we're dedicated, we're focused, you know, we got a tough mindset. So, so true. That's a, that's a great point for our listeners. A lot of culture, they're trying to develop that. Mm, I really like that. It sort of puts the um, controllables uh, sorry, it puts the, the actions back in control of the athlete. You're not sort of um, being vague about it. You've actually got to take responsibility. 
Um, Phil, just quickly on the um, personality profiles. Uh, I, I was more on the thinker structure side. Rainsy was more on the flexible side. Um, just as an example for teams or coaches listening out there, what could what's an example of how um, two contrasting um, personalities can help each other and be successful? For example, what could what could I do for Rainsy? What could Rainsy do for me to make us successful as a as a um, as a group as a team? Well, actually, there's just before I actually answer a particular question you asked, one one of the things is that if I'm coaching a Rainsy, I would never be telling him what to do. I was saying, this is what we're trying to achieve. Why? Yep. And then if there's a problem, I say, I get him to look for, why do you think this didn't work? See, we're inductive. Sherlock Holmes never used deduction, despite what Watson said. He went to the crime scene, worked his way back. He's inductive. So if I'm trying to debrief with Rainsy, so let's look at this. Why do you think it didn't work? With you, Harry, you're structured. I said, listen, there's three things we need to look at because I haven't done these things. Yep. And same thing, in, in teaching, in a coaching session, and Lee Matthews is really good with the players on this. He, he knew a lot of players why. He said, so what we're trying to do is get the opposition to do this. We're trying to do this. And he explained the logic. And then he said, but here's what I want you to do to the structured players. Yeah, right. This is what we want you to do. And likewise, when he debriefed with them, it's the same we're just talking about it. The structured players, you know, the, the Vosses, the Lappins, those sort of guys. This is what we need to look at. And this is what we need to fix. With the... Akas and the lepers, who at that stage a bit more mozzy in them, uh, is why. Let's look at why we had to do that, okay? And uh, and so you do that differently. Now, Jimmy Ma, who was a mozzy, and Aunt Ma Aunt Ma 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 Matthew Hayden, who was a structured, when they were batting, they would actually talk to one another and say, listen, you're talking too much. Ma, Ma, Ma would tell to uh, Hados. Yep. And Hados, they say, Mabo, you've gone quiet. <laughs> right. And so they worked out little things. Like yeah. Mabo used to have a little pebble at the end of a um, Jimmy Ma, sorry for nicknames. Uh, and he had kick it between every ball because he knew if he moved his seat, do that. Matthew Hayden was so structured, so organized, every break he did these same things. So that's why it's important for you to say, if you see Rainsy being too quiet and thoughtful, you're saying, go back to your Mazi mode. Conversely, your two big problems are getting grumpy because when you get grumpy you now are attacking the opponent not the game and you always want to be attacking the game yeah, right. and likewise you'll get stubborn I remember there's a cricketer a, a spinner not warning He's, I said oh you're an enforcer he said what's that mean it means you're stubborn no I'm not <laughs> uh, so whereas Rainsy is easier convinced and I but we're easily unconvinced Harry you're harder to convince but you'll stay convinced. Yeah, right. So Rainsy with you has got to say, you're leaving your structure. Because when you leave your structure, you turn the computer off. Mm -hmm. Whereas Rainsy doesn't have a structure. Matter of fact, you get structured, his computer's off. Mm. So it's him, come on, start smiling, start moving, start chatting. And whereas you need more time. We, we had a player with the Lions, uh, Jared, who was a real mozzie. And we didn't want him to think. So we knew before the game, you know you have the players meeting the day before the game and everybody comes in the room and mm -hmm. Bradshaw is basically in a wheelchair everybody except Jared knew that uh, he wasn't going to play and Lee says look looks like everybody's okay and everybody's looking at Bradshaw anyway, it looks like everybody's okay and uh, anyway but Lee said you emergencies and Jared was a emergency just keep your mobile phone in case I have to call you we actually let him suit up with reserves did the warm-up, hmm. and just before that, oh, we just found out Bradshaw can't play. Anyway, he had a blinder. Right. And he said, I'm so glad you didn't know that I had to play beforehand. Hmm. Whereas a couple, about a month later, Richard Hadley, who's a thinker, we knew he'd play. We gave him a week's notice. Yeah. Because the thinkers need time to process it, to get in. So it's different it. rules yeah. for different people. And so as, as you're talking about yourselves, as you know your profiles, you can actually see when your mates go into the plan set. And I've never found a mate annoyed mm. when the other mate says to a mate, you, you've gone to Z. If somebody says to me, Phil, you're being really quiet, yeah. Yeah. Z, yeah. you know, or whatever, yeah. uh, or that you suddenly become really crazy chatting, anyway, but you're not following your processes. So for example, in the interviews, you'll need to be organized Rainsy has got to follow his instincts. So true. Just back him because if you try to if you try to organize what you want to do in an interview, uh, Andrew, you'll suck. 
Whereas you try to be just back yourself, <laughs> Harry will suck. Both valid computers. You should see the notes I've got up here, Phil. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a bit like that. So we're, we're for the listeners and, and you out there, Phil. We've got a Harry does an incredible job with the with the podcast and structures up all the questions. Where I I actually and, he, and 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 I actually relate to it and I look at it, but I I go on the run more. I can ask. I'm feel mm. you know I'm sort of on the that's your planet that instinct, and I'm going yeah yeah heats better, which is uh it's it's interesting. And it's good because I I struggle to do that. Yeah, <laughs> and so rainsy has got the. He compliments it in that way. And like he's mentioned, with more time. I think yeah, I need more time to prepare for something. And that's what makes a good relationship. Mm. Usually, mm. in happy relationships, the, the partner is almost always the opposite. Like my wife is the opposite. Yeah, my me, wife's. Where yes. she takes yep. longer to prepare. I'm instinctive. And that makes strengths yep. weaknesses. Because if you're the same, yep. it doesn't work. And as I say, computers are good. My wife's computer, my computer is good. But you don't put my software on her computer and hers on mine because yeah. of crash. Like Microsoft is good, don't put it on an Apple. Apple's good, mm. don't put it on Microsoft. Yeah. And one of the mistakes people make, and this is why I do profiles, one of the mistakes people make is they think empathy was what would I do if I was mm. in your shoes? But see, what Phil Jonesy would do in both your shoes mm. is different mm. than what you do. And it's important for me to think, if I was you in your shoes, what would I do? And I'm you in your shoes, what would it mean when I do this? Because like those, those players are talking when Lee was being quiet, they're saying when they're quiet, mm. they're annoyed. Whereas Lee just meant there was nothing mm. to say. And so it's important to understand we don't try to use empathy as saying, what would I do mm. if I was you? It's actually, what would you do? Spot you on. being you. And just a, just quick on, Harry's yeah. going to wrap up shortly. It's been absolutely incredible. Just just for the coaches and players out there. Um, so Mozzie's that sort of bubbly, talkative, up and about, enforces more that um, you know sort of demanding, ruthless, sort of straight down the line. Um, you know, sort of that big sort of power overpowering sort of sometimes um, thinkers a bit sort of more that more structured more you know have to take time to sort of think through it. What's and the quieter? What's and what's the feeler part? Uh, if elaborate a bit more on that. Feeler, feelers are we, feelers. We we want to give value yep. at it, and so we'll really be very cruel on ourselves. It's not what you think about us in an ego sense. It's that we let you down. So feelers, when we make a mistake in a game. We tend to pull back because we think we've hurt the yep. team. Thinkers worry about it and stop moving. Now, interesting, both thinkers and feelers, as you might saw in that profile we had above below the, the line, that anybody who's bigger below the line, um, they, they, I, there's a term in biology called metamorphosis, is where a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. So what happens is the thinker feelers are quiet before the game, but as they get closer to the game, the th feelers become more mozzy, thinkers become more yep. enforcer, and others, it takes a while, and you used to always say, as I say, make your first tackle the best tackle. Well, that's fine for the Mozzie enforcers, but for the thinker feelers, it takes a while to mm -hmm. get into it. So the Nigel we're talking before, wonderful player, he was okay at the beginning, but he got better mm -hmm. as the game yep. went on. Whereas the enforcers, mm -hmm. the thinkers start at mm -hmm. full throttle, and uh, if anything might go down, they get fatigued. And so it's learning different things. And so you can actually see the player say, well, now I've become the butterfly. Mm -hmm. And so what you'll find is that a thinker feeler away from the game are really quiet and sometimes in games for example a lot of sports they say you got to talk no they don't mean talk like I mean we had a guy in rugby league Darren Lockyer all Australian one of the best football players around but he communicated he wasn't a chatterbox mm. he talked when things need to be said so when we say you have to talk it's actually talking about when your players need mm. to hear you talk is not just saying gabba 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 now Andrew and I and here all three of us we can talk easily even have nothing mm. to say but the thinker feelers you watch they only talk when they got something mm. to say and quite often mm. you find the, your teammates listen more to the thinker mm. feelers than the Mozzie enforcers because quite often what we say makes no sense whereas the thinker feelers when they speak they have something to say and there's a message to be heard yeah oh that's fantastic and it's all about trying to understand yourself and others which is I believe is the name of your book Phil yeah my second book uh, first book is called sorry first book is called Understanding Yourself and Others and second book is Managing Yourself and others beautiful and the third book which is this an uh, i book it's called power of positive doing awesome awesome some some, some great themes there and um phil if people want to learn a little bit more about your concepts or get in touch with you um they can obviously read your books but how else could they get in touch with you if they're um if they're excited by what they heard today well uh, i have a website which philjohnsey.com it's easy you just have to google it and you'll find it quickly quick, it's got some videos of what we're on that and got the books and also got contact details if they want to contact me. And I should suggest on the profiles, 
Lee's book, Lee Matthews' book, uh, it's got a really good chapter uh, on the on the profiles. Oh, yep. uh, it's chapter twelve. If if you if so, if somebody has that book, they might want to read it uh, or get get it from the library. Fantastic. We'll um, put the link to all of that in the show notes. Just wait till Phil's got his earphones back in. So. Um, Thanks, Phil. We'll, um, we'll make sure everyone's got the, uh, the the details to source the book and your website. But, um, mate, thank you so much for joining us. You've been really generous with your time. And, um, yeah, we really appreciate you coming on. And please thank my your wife to... as well for helping set it up. Okay, yeah, she's my organizer. I, she's become my PA, so I tell people I sleep with my secretary and my wife doesn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> she's a bit more structured too, Phil, so help, helping helping out, that's great. Yeah, yeah, she, she does help me unbelievably. Okay, guys, all the best. Take care. Thanks for listening to the one-on-one football podcast. If you got something out of today's episode, we'd love it if you could leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to stay updated on special guests, new episodes, and more, please subscribe to the show on your chosen platform. And finally, if you have any questions for Rainsy or myself, or you want to get a particular guest on the show, please reach out. Our email address is podcast at one-on-onefootball.com.au. Thanks, guys. We'll see you for the next episode.